This is not a test Don't expect to be impressed Put on your life vest Sit down your armrest It's turn to stray from the grind Don't take my hand cause you'll find Hi there and welcome to Authors and Dragons Side Quest, the in-between episodes we do when we're not having fantastical adventures. We're either talking pop culture, talking crap, or introducing a fantastic guest. You can guess which one we've got for you today. But before we get to that, the regular dudes, the normal guys. Got myself, Steve Weverell, Rick Walteri, Robert Bevan, Drew Hayes. Say hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Howdy, howdy. And because it is the spooky season, because we are gearing up to Halloween, let's get straight into our fascinating spooky guest. Uh, you might know him by his original pen name, David Wong, uh, Jason Pargin. How do you do? I'm doing well, and my voice is slowly failing me. Uh, people who listen to me normally, may I may sound a little bit more uh, gravelly than normal. This is not because I'm sick, it is because... This is leading up to book release week, and I've recorded like eight hours of podcasts in the last three days. Um, and so my throat feels raw, and the bad thing is I cannot seek medical help for it. Because how do you say to a doctor, I was podcasting too hard, and I've injured my throat? Uh, like... Shamefully. Yeah. Here's your diagnosis. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> You're in a hospital full of people with long COVID and everything else. Like they're gonna they're gonna kick you out of there. They're gonna they're gonna call security and ask you or escort you from the building. So this is my my hard life that I'm dealing with. Uh, my problems are surely worse than all of yours. But if my voice gives out partway through, if I start coughing, I'm sure we will edit the coughing out. But I have That's lozenges. Fine. I've got like literal sore throat lozenges to treat my my podcast mouth is what I'm <laughs> using these lodges lozenges just to treat. I've got a cup oh of God. hot cup of hot tea here that I'm drinking in between sentences. God. Podcast hot. mouth. I didn't realize that was a possibility, but it yeah, is. No, See, no. Oh, neither did I, because I <laughs> thought that to lose your voice, you needed to do like strenuous yelling uh, for hours on end. Uh, but no, it turns out just speaking in a normal tone of voice for a couple of hours a day, my body is so fragile. That's all it took to ruin the mechanism that I used to speak is just because I. it's not like I'm on these shows where we're screaming at each other. I don't know if there are even our shows like that. Not it's yet. Just like this. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're not. So, uh, yeah, I'm disappointed in, in my, my body as I always am, but I work from home. And to be frank, I don't talk to people that much. <laughs> I talk to my wife. Otherwise, it's all over email. And so I think I don't talk enough to have built up the talking muscles and so now that i actually have to have conversations uh i'm i'm not able to hold up to the strain so you're not coming here from a secondary career as a power metal vocalist then because that might have been useful <laughs> to you but oh, well. no but it's given me a new admiration for for what they do i mean that's uh yeah i think what you need to do is let your let your like fame go to your head and start and just start walking around your house talking to yourself in third person. Build up the vocal <laughs> muscles right there. Yeah, just get the practice. Slowly go, slowly go mad. Yeah. <laughs> it does have its advantages, apparently. <laughs> Proofs against podcast mouth. Ask you a question I probably should have asked before the show started. We are we are seeing each other on a, a Zoom like interface. Does this video go up anywhere? Do you have a YouTube channel? Do people watch watch this? Well, Jason, I'm glad you asked, because we do have a YouTube channel. <laughs> okay. That's YouTube.com forward slash Authors and Dragons. Check it out. Why don't you, if you listen to us on podcast. Uh, expand your horizons. Come and see our faces. Or, or don't. You can just listen. It's okay. Uh, I probably, in retrospect... See, here's the thing. Like this is a horror novel, um, and it's the series I'm most, mostly uh, known for as a novelist. But I also write science fiction books. When I'm promoting the horror novel, I feel like horror writers are like they're they're spooky horror people. 
So I should have stuff in the background. I should have skulls or something back here or something like I'm a cool horror artifact guy. Where it's like I've mm. got oh, this is the original mask from Friday the 13th back here. <laughs> and, and instead, it's just my, my freaking window because my desk is, is just crammed up against the wall. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like the, yeah, like the stuffed penis you have there. Um, of course, it's pretty horrific. And then when and then when I switched to promoting the uh, the science fiction series, then I could have nerd stuff back here behind me. But either way, it's totally undecorated. I apologize to your audience that I don't. You guys have got cool stuff behind you, and I just have I just have my blinds. This is the one place in my house I'm allowed to keep my stuff. That's the only reason I have stuff behind me. <laughs> no, I, I I would I would love like clean shelves and like maybe sane color like you know walls and stuff <laughs> but like literally in my house i am allowed about 10 square feet to store my shit steve's <laughs> shitty plant is rocking my Just... world <laughs> 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 well it's very avant-garde we don't know what's behind that window it could be all kinds of sci-fi horror stuff uh i'm sure our <laughs> listeners slash viewers will just use their imaginations god i i hope halfway through this podcast the shades open up and just body parts start pouring. <laughs> well, we can't promise that, but you never know. <laughs> but we can tease it. We certainly can. Stay tuned for later. When <laughs> so, uh, a bit of background, I guess, because um, not to date you, but I, you started your writing career in uh, what I think is like the golden age of the birth of internet comedy, or at least written internet comedy. Uh, kind of late nineties, early two thousands, I think, were pointless waste of time. Yeah, I was. I got in on the ground floor of the internet. If I have an advantage as a writer, it was that that I started a site probably in nineteen ninety eight, ninety seven, and this is back when services like GeoCities that some of the some of your younger listeners maybe don't even know what that is. Um, but no, I, I had a get a dial up internet connection in the late nineties and started writing stuff really for the first time in my life, and then from there, my like my writing career kind of grew from that. But the, my ability to get an audience back then, like if I had been born later, and was trying to get an audience today via just purely through TikTok or whatever, I don't know what what would have become of me. But it was in that era. Now, to be clear. Some of the people who do remember the late 90s internet, I, we do realize that a lot of the jokes written back then were literal hate crimes <laughs> today. It, it, a lot of it was stuff that is, is, was like, it's good that it's forgotten. But it was, it was an era when the, a lot of the voice of the internet, as you know it now, the blogging voice, a lot of stuff you kind of take for granted was invented in those days. It's, and so I was a fan of other early internet writers and there was a, a particular style of blogging back then. It was extremely dense. Like every sentence had a punchline and it was very like articulate and nerdy and there's tons of references. And it was just, it was this particular style I'd never run into before, but I fell in love with it and fell in love with trying to do it myself. I, like that, I came alive when that happened. You're right. There was a lot of stuff that was written that was, let's be honest, kind of horrific. But at the same time, it was kind of funny as fuck. <laughs> because because of that punchline thing because people were just i don't know they were just going for the jokes and like you know even like even as you like felt horrible laughing at it it was still kind of funny <laughs> it was a savage primordial time for internet yeah. comedy yeah for example it's also right when south park came in the scene so like that south park style of extremely crude but also kind of smart but like trying to universally offend everybody <laughs> and and that same sensibility it was kind of very libertarian but also very like white and nerdy and you know like the references were all stuff that it just assumed everybody you know everybody got well it's uh from that that um well i guess we should mention that the book you're promoting currently is if this if you're reading this book you're in the wrong universe if is, yeah it's specifically if this book exists you're in the wrong universe is. it has a neon green cover that is <laughs> extremely easy to spot even if you don't remember the title and i totally understand if you go to the bookstore, if they've got it face out, you should be able to spot it from the street. That I this is by design. It's like I I don't know how else to get people's attention. It's it's a very garish book cover. Uh, you can't miss it on the shelf. Yeah, no stranger to weird titles because the first book in this installment of uh, I guess Slackers versus Cosmic Horror was John Dies at the End, which came I think directly out of that uh, soup of um, 
I guess, obscene and strange internet comedy. And that started on the Pointless Waste of Time website as a serial novel, I believe. And uh, among your fans, if they've connected with any of my work, it probably is the John Dies at the End movie. Um, And a lot of people who've seen the movie don't know it was a book or a book series. This is actually the fourth book in that series. But that, yeah, that film was based on about half of the book. Um, But yeah, I actually had this website that would, a format that would come to become known as a blog later, but that word did not exist when I started it. It was just this this thing where I could type words and it appeared on people's screens and that was whatever you called that. It was a website. Um, And that was what the internet was at the time. Like there was no video. Images were slow to load. It was text and people typing, writing about themselves, their diaries. It was prior to social media, prior to YouTube, prior to everything. So I just had this blog where it was just whatever popped into my head. I was developing, I was learning how to write. I hadn't done it. Um, And it was just whatever. It was essays and it was columns and it was movie reviews. It was just whatever. But every year at Halloween, I would post a little horror story, a little first-person horror story in, in the voice of the fictional character that told all the stories on the site. And... It was every year I would add a little bit more to it, and it that story, like completely separate from the blog, that story that I had come to call the series John Dies at the End as a joke, um, went viral. It, it grew its own fan base, and it got to where there were people who only showed up at the site in October, because they came back every year for, for this thing. Um, and I, this was at a time when there was no fiction writing scene online. There was no none of the fanfic sites or any of that stuff that exists now where there's entire, you know, cultures based around different types of fanfic and, and all the different sites and, and and Wattpad and all of those. None of that existed. Or if it did, I it wasn't mainstream. Oh no. Um, it, it didn't exist. I I I didn't know about the web serial. However, I did read the book before I saw the movie. Okay. Um <laughs> Well, no, but that but that's rare because the the book was before I sold the film rights to it. The book had only been sold to a few thousand people. It, like, because what had happened was at the end of writing this online, I had people m- emailing me with pictures of where they had printed it all out as like one volume and, and tied it together with like rubber bands. And like, I made it into a book. I was like, well, that's stupid. It should be, there should be an edition people can, <laughs> there should, if people want to read it, because it makes, if you've ever sat, tried to sit down and read 150,000 words on an old CRT monitor, you understand why they were doing it. It's like, no, I want to read it as a book. It's a, it's a novel. So I sat down and did an editing pass on it and then did back then on Cafe Press, you know, which is a, like a t-shirt coffee mug mm-hmm. site they out they also would let you upload a pdf and they would sell a, a book so there was a kind of a self-publishing thing and i just sold these at cost and then uh, an indie book publisher horror book publisher called permuted press came along and asked if they could do like a nicer edition they're like if we do it um it'll have, have like an isdn number it'll go on amazon like people can actually buy it as a book instead of just having to buy it through cafe press so i agreed and we sold a few thousand copies that way, which I thought at the time was like, well, you know, it's a fun little thing that's happened. You know, I sold a few, there's a few people around the world that have enjoyed this little book. I didn't realize that selling a few thousand copies of a book is actually an accomplishment. Like most of the books you see on the shelves of bookstores, they, they've not sold a few thousand copies. Like doing this as just with no promotion is just me and my website and, and this and they were doing like a print on demand thing, like you would order it and they would print it and ship it to you um, as like an expensive paperback, you know, edition. I, I didn't realize that was a big deal, but still with just a few thousand copies of that in the world, one of them wound up in the hands of Don Coscarelli, the writer, director, producer behind the Phantasm series and Bubba Hotep, um, who is a, a, a um, has like cult horror legend like has a huge fan base and he contacts me emails me saying do you have an agent i i want to see about getting film rights to this to this book like somehow he got i think on amazon it like recommended to him like you based on this book you like you may like john dies the end and he thought the title was funny and so he ordered he ordered a copy loved it 
thought this is like perfect, you know, Don Coscarelli material. Um, and after I, this is, this next part is a story I tell a lot because it's kind of legend among people who know who I am, but I thought the email was like a, like, like a, not like a prank. I thought it was like a, like a phishing attempt because if you're, a, if you were an amateur writer back then, you would get emails from people from like vanity presses and stuff saying, well, if you pay us $500, we'll print copies of your book. So an email saying, Hey, we want to make your book into a movie. Just like, okay, get out of here. It's, it's something where you're going to want me to pay for something. And then you're going to like, you know, um, and I didn't reply. And then he was just persistent in trying to get, not <laughs> trying to get the name of my agent. Well, I didn't, I didn't have one. It, it, people have to understand. I was working at an insurance company during this time and not like, not like writing ads for them. I was doing data entry. I was not a professional writer in, on any level. I was a blogger, and during the day, I worked in an office typing numbers into insurance claim forms. So he contacts me, and finally, I answer his email, and finally get on the phone with him. And he not just doesn't just want the rights to the story; he wants to make the movie. Like that's that's the part that never happens is that the thing actually gets gets made. So sure enough, we sold the rights. A few years later, um, I get word that. Like it's going in production. Paul Giamatti is on board as a producer, and they've got they're lining up other stars. And then it would be five years after he contacted me. Is in 2012 it debuted at Sundance, and that put that got me a new book deal. It put the second book on the New York Times bestseller list, and that's why I'm I have a full time novel writing career right now. It's because of this one guy stumbling across this one copy of this book that by all rights he should never have even heard of. Um, and now, and now I can, now it's a big deal when I release a book and, and they're for sale all over the world, but it's all because of that, that one break. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's that one break, but it's like, you know, but your work keeps you there because it was, if it was just that fluke, I mean, you know, I mean, right guy in the right universe. Sure. But, uh, yeah, if you read the book and thought it was terrible, then yeah, then none of this happens. <laughs> like I, I do think yeah. the book is good. I, I put my entire blood and tears into it you know it took five years of of like you know obsessively writing and rewriting and editing and all of my early ideas from my youth everything i put everything into it um but but i wasn't doing it because like this is going to make my career as a novelist i didn't think that was on the table i i i, I wasn't you know i didn't travel in those circles i didn't have writer friends um i just wanted it was like a chance to tell a story to people and they've never done it before it's almost a perfect pokemon evolution of a story from <laughs> web serial to <laughs> self-published to trad published to movie it's like final form that's great but i feel like these days it i, I think when i tell a story now it's less of a remarkable story because it feels like well half the book deals are a, a, a bloggers getting book deals or, or people with big twitter accounts you know getting you could be made, made a movie out of your twitter account like now that's the thing that pipeline didn't exist back then or if it did i had never heard of it like i i had never heard of somebody in that era you know talking about the mid 2000s um when this thing was was you know early to mid 2000s i didn't think that was a thing like i wasn't sitting there thinking gosh if this gets in the hands of, of hollywood maybe we'll have something i never thought i never thought yeah. that would happen yeah but again those like you know those those channels exist now it's still, you still have to have that longevity, you still have to have that talent. I mean, at this point, I mean, what, what do you have? Like seven or eight books, books out? I have six. This is, th this one is book four in this series. I have a separate sci-fi series as two novels in it um, that I've got, like I've, I've signed a book deal for three more books. So I'm under contract for books seven, eight, and nine. Yeah. So I, I have, you know, and again, I've tried to keep, you know, improving uh, at, at the craft of it um or or whatever because again i don't come from i i didn't have an english degree i didn't come from that background of a literary background uh you know my parents were not writers i didn't live in new york or any of that i i you know i, I this all happened when i was in my late 20s early 30s and prior to that was just i was just taking a series of office jobs Speaking as someone with an English degree, you didn't miss much. <laughs> where, where did your uh, crack.com career fit into this? Because when I when I said I read the book first, I wasn't trying to impress you with my my extensive you know reading or whatever. No, I, it's because I saw 
I, I, I was already a fan of you, and I said, oh, Jason Pargin wrote a book. I gotta get that. That's a... Uh, and then, you know, the movie was later. Yeah, so the... I got the crack job also in 2007. Basically, the, the arc of, of my story was I screwed around trying to have, like, writing on the side. and Because at the time, when I started writing the blog, this was during, like, the dot-com bubble years. And I thought, well, I think people become, like, millionaires doing this. Like, just typing stuff on the internet. Like, I think they, I think they make tons of money. And that obviously didn't, you know, now we, you you make no money making online content whatsoever, but that had, hadn't become clear at the time. Well, I persisted for almost a decade, almost, you know, it was from the late nineties until 2007, so eight, eight or nine years, uh, writing every week, posting every week, growing an audience, but not making any kind of money, let alone the kind of money where you could like quit your job and right. replace it with, you know, the, the stuff you're doing on the internet. So I had reached a point in 2006 or so where it was, you know, you can do, I was born in 1975, so it's like, okay, I'm, I'm now at 31, and I have, like, I'm working dead-end office jobs that I got through a temp agency, and my writing is making me, I think I did, I did the math, and it was like $1.50 an hour or something like that. You took the time I put into it, you know, and then subtract the expenses, the band rads were just not... Pain, they're paying a few hundred dollars a month. So I had decided to give up on it because it's like, I've got to get a career. I've got to get something that has health insurance and a 401k and, and the, a career with the advancement <laughs> potential. And there's somewhere on in deep in the internet archives, there's a forum post for me telling the people on the message boards of my site, like, I can't, you know, I've got to, I've got to, like, I'm, I'm internet famous, as in I've got tens of thousands of readers, you know, and people love my work, but that doesn't translate into anything. And so I've got to, so within a three-week span in 2007, I got contacted by Don to buying the film rights to the book and got contacted by Crack.com saying, hey, we are trying to relaunch the site in, after the ruins of the old magazine that went under we need an assistant editor who can work from home writing comedy and editing articles huh. for twice what you're making now. So I got, I got the job at Cranked, as, and I would wind up working there for the next 13 years. I worked there right up until tw the early 2020, right before the pandemic. Um, and, and yeah, and so the other people who have heard of me, they only know me from the Cranked columns I did, because that site for a while got very, very popular in, in around 2012, 2013 era was had something like 25 million readers a month. Um, and then it, it petered out when the, the digital publishing industry collapsed entirely in uh, 26, 2016, 2017, around then. Um, so yeah, I was doing both. So I was the, the second and third books that were written, those were written while I was working 80 hour work, weeks at Cracked and doing my columns and doing editing there. It was. It was very busy, and I was sleeping like five hours a night. It wasn't good for my. It wasn't good for my health, and I'm not recommending anybody do that part of it. <laughs> as an interest, not to derail, but as an interesting side note, uh, Bevan and I actually met in the Crack.com writer forums, which is the only oh, really? reason I'm on True. this podcast. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> If uh, Bevan hadn't in, uh, insulted me in your forums, I wouldn't be here today. So there you go. That's a nice little well, link for the listeners there. Well, but there's some mythology there too that's worth, that's worth exploring because what had happened was when that job opened up, um, that they that editor job at Cranked, they, the people they were looking at, a lot of them were people that had either done the job before or they were people either in LA or New York who had a lot of like, comedian friends, people they could bring, like talent they could bring on board. I had none of that. I was living in, you know, rural Illinois, you know, and just this guy who works in an office. But one thing I had done was on our message board on our site was we would, we had taken submissions through there at pointless waste of time and had kind of built a community of funny people because I would, I would post work from other people by that point. And we had like a, a process by which people could submit. Well, I pitched that to Cracked as saying, I don't have famous writer friends, but let me show you the work we're producing out of this, what, what we're calling the, the workshop. It's just a part of my message board. 
And for the listeners who don't know, it was just, it was a private invite only message board where people could come in and not just pitch article ideas because that kind of thing you can get anywhere. They could pitch article ideas and then someone would actually read them and give them feedback and provide coaching if, if their thing was way off the mark instead of the thing that you would get when freelance writing where you're just sending stuff into a void and where you just you don't know if anybody's seen it you don't it, like it's just such a discouraging process it's like no here's a space where we have it as a rule you're not allowed to insult people you're not allowed to make fun of their ideas if you do that you're gone you're not allowed to be snide with people this is not shark tank you're not roasting people it is a community of writers of creative people who are all helping each other and trying yeah. to teach each other, like the the voice of the site, you know, or, or what works as a good source. If you're trying to use it, you know, like if you're sourcing a, a claim in an article, like here's the good sources you can use that kind of thing, and walking them through it and in a supportive environment. And we built basically an empire a crack doing that. Like that's where the content from crack came from, is we were training writers, and when you came in, there was no process <laughs> where you had to like give your resume and say, well, I've written for, you know, Maxim and I've written for, you know, College Humor and I've done this. Stuff. No, not only that, we wouldn't allow you to. We didn't care. We only cared about how good your idea was and how good your writing was because I didn't have a resume. See, right. so I could not build a place where it's like, no, I only want the cream of the crop because I wasn't the cream of the crop. I was hired from an insurance company. So it created a unique place on the internet where, I mean, at one point we had tens of thousands of people who were members of that workshop. Like it was this thriving community. And then when I talk about how Cracked at one point had an audience of, you know, like 25 million readers in a month, like across, across the course of a month, that's whose work they were seeing. It was these writers out of this workshop and some of them were middle-aged housewives. Some of them were 16-year-old kids. One guy, we had multiple people writing from sub-Saharan Africa. In, in Europe and Sweden and Australia and all around the world, as long as they knew English and they could write in the in the language and had you know an eye for what we wanted, which was stuff that was smart and it was funny. It wasn't mean spirited. Hopefully, it wasn't you know punching down. It was just um, and it was a voice that now I feel like you can see everywhere. It's the Daily Show. It's the John Oliver Show. But it was at cracked before it was there in in many cases it was just trying to I'll be... admit you uh, crack was a huge influence on me yes and also i didn't really insult steve <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into that sure much, sure, right. sure you didn't but yeah i, I remember <laughs> that like i was in the writer that writer's forum and like i only wound up submitting two articles and they weren't they weren't, they weren't very good but that was one thing i appreciated it was that okay you know you let some schmuck like me in actually read it and give feedback and uh you know it even if that feedback was saying okay this is what you need to fix because you know this this is not very good but it was yeah it was it was a pretty cool place <laughs> yeah it was uh there was definitely a golden age there and it was uh, it was kind of a mecca for uh internet bullshitters certainly hmm. yeah i think i uh, getting a, an article published on Cracked is probably my comedy or writing highlight. Def well, no problem. Yeah, definitely my, my highlight. Yeah. A lot of people in England don't really know Cracked over like Maximum stuff like that. But uh, I think for, for those in the know when it comes to funny bullshit, yeah, everybody knows Cracked.com. Seven years on this podcast and like Steve's like, yeah, I had this one article on that. That was the highlight <laughs> yeah. of my life. <laughs> yeah, fuck you guys. <laughs> but for those of you who don't, like, like I know lots of people don't, because of the nature of the internet, a lot of people aren't familiar with that particular site. But at the height of things, a bad article on Cracked would be read by 150,000 people. When I say bad, I mean an unpopular one that didn't do well. And the one that did well, the range was around from 600,000 all the way up to 5 million. Because that was an era back when internet articles could go viral, like that was still a thing. It's not anymore. But that was an era when you would, when an article that hit, you know, it would show up on Dig. Remember Dig back when it was a thing? It would show yep. up on Reddit. Oh, wow. It would show up on Slashdot. <laughs> there were all these huge aggregators of like nerd type content. And a good article from Crank would show up at the front page of all of them. And so the idea that somebody, you know, who's 
whatever they're they're 22 years old and this is the first thing they've ever written and they've reached 300,000 people it, there's like there, that's miraculous like there's something wonderful about that yes the comments are full of you know several hundred people calling them names and using slurs but at the same time like reaching that many people to me that was like the most utopian version of the internet you could have because somebody has an idea because the best articles that cranked were people writing about something that they thought was only a weird interest they had like they're super into civil war history like they're obsessed with civil war their family their friends nobody wants to hear about the civil war but here's cranked and here you can have like oh i've got an idea for like the the five dumbest civil war battles and, and i i am a fountain of knowledge about the subject and when they write it, you can feel it. You can feel like, oh, this guy's a nerd for this. And that's what Crack was. It was this huge um, community of people who were just passionate nerds about whatever, that we did not have a beat. You could, your article could be about pro wrestling. It could be about NASCAR. It could be about ancient Greek history. It could be about insects, mating habits. The thing was, you were passionate about it. You cared about it. You were telling the truth. And then we would try to help you make it funny and interesting and entertaining and, and all of that. So I, I, I could talk all day about, like, I think what we did at Cracked was truly an accomplishment. But the internet, the way the internet works and the way the internet economy works just changed and, and crushed it. But, but that's part of it was for bad reasons, but part of it was just the world just moved on. But it's too bad because I don't think there's an equivalent now like i think that same creative person no. would have to try to find their fame on something like tiktok and tiktok is going to favor a lot of things like your personal appearance how well you speak you know things like that 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 again the whole idea was like we were early on we're a text only site like it doesn't matter only your ideas matter whereas now to go big you need a youtube channel something like that and it's so much more are you attractive? Are you at least compelling to look at? And most of us are are not. Not insulting yeah. you guys. Obviously, you. you know, <laughs> I, I, I've said it myself. I was like, I could come up with the most hilarious content on TikTok on my TikTok channel, and somebody who just like you know walks on wearing a bikini will get a million times more <laughs> more views than me. Have you tried the bikini, Rick? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. And my my re my listenership went way down. <laughs> Fair. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's it's interesting mentioning the the passion of the ideas of early cracked because um, I can't count the subjects that I I wasn't on the forums or anything, but I visited fairly regularly and I can't count the number of things that I now know or the subjects that I got into just because I read a cracked article about it. It's much easier to remember things when there's a dick joke in there, like sprinkled throughout, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and people would go it's like you've got the stuff you can bring this up at a party if you're the type to go to parties i wasn't but it's like you've got an interesting fact that you can bring up and it makes you sound cool to your friends like that was a big thing a big draw for crack people would remember that stuff and occasionally you'd see people out in the wild bring up an interesting fact and then the other person would be like crack right <laughs> you, you saw that on crack that was on there two days ago uh it, you know back when it, you're, you're making me sad because I'm remembering when it was at its apex. Now, the, the experience of working there was brutal because the going through the workshop and working through the pitches and all that, extremely time consuming. That's why the uh, long term, like the financial aspects of it wound up not working because when when the way I could get into the boring details of it, but when the finance, the financial part stopped working, um. It, that's where the cost of like running that workshop is what sank us because it is it, caught is expensive in the sense that it took, it was a lot of man hours to sift through the stuff because the whole thing was that we did give every pitch attention, which is great when you have a huge audience and you're getting good ad rates. But when that market collapsed for a bunch of reasons, that I don't know if people will find interesting or not. Um, it, it was it wasn't sustainable anymore it just couldn't be like it if people are out there listening well how do i get there it's like it's gone i'm sorry yeah. it's gone oh yeah and, cr and let me crack crack.com is still there i mean I, facebook likes to push stuff there but like the content is so different yeah. like like go it, it's it's like it's it's like a pale shadow of of what it used to be 
Um, and I have friends who still work there and, and and I get it, but the way the way the internet works now, if you want to write online, it's like you'll get paid the, the the stuff that's the freelance stuff that's out there, it's like fifteen bucks to knock out fifteen articles or twenty articles a day and you just pound them out, just boom. Because it's all stuff like um if if you look at site, st- sites, I, I don't even know which in any of the sites that you should see get linked on Twitter where there's in a, like a movie trailer goes up and they'll mash out 500 words about the trailer, just telling you about the trailer. Like that's most of what internet content is now because that's the only thing that's profitable. It's the only way to make money off of it. And, you know, the profit has to matter because you've got to pay, you've got to pay employees. Like there's got to, so the fact that the business model doesn't work, like you can blame, you know, the capitalism. Um, but it, it, the way it is now, as it exists now, either you're the New York Times and you have a paying subscriber base that's 10 million strong, or you're like two guys on Patreon where people, you know, a, a, a couple of thousand people paying you, you know, whatever, how many thousand dollars a month will pay the expenses of a couple of people, but you can't have like a huge, anything in the middle, where, like where crack was, um, is almost impossible to do because that audience has moved on to podcast and YouTube and Twitch and, and like they just it just doesn't exist anymore. It's a different it's a different internet for for better for worse. Now I think for worse, but I also uh, you know well speaking of that uh, Patreon dot com <laughs> forward slash authors and dragons. Should you want to support this podcast, <laughs> please do. Of a few people <laughs> doing their best for all the yeah. reasons just stated there eloquently. <laughs> now, speaking of TikTok and uh, weird facts, something you were kind of famous for before John dies at the end. Although it is kind of the basis of a lot of the fiction in John dies at the end, is you're quite fascinated by weird observations about reality which is something you've been doing on your tiktok videos for example one of your more famous early days articles was the monkey sphere which was a humorous introduction to dunbar's number um uh listeners please do look that up it's hilarious and informative and uh, interesting so what is your favorite weird fact Ooh, that's good the the dunbar's number thing i think I like stuff like that. Anything that is not just weird, but is weird in a way that kind of helps me make sense of the world. Um, and with that, for people not familiar with it, it's basically the idea that humans' brains are only built to identify a certain number of other individuals because for most of our evolution, we operated in fairly small uh, tribes. So, what Robin Dunbar said was that. Um, that it's around 150 people. And if you look at hunter gatherers, like they tend to gather in tribes of around 150. Um, ancient militaries tended to have companies of around 150. Like that's, it's like roughly the size of a group you can get together before the stuff starts happening. The factions start forming, it starts to become ungovernable. All of the things you think of as like the problems of modern society kind of comes down to the fact that outside of this circle of other people you kind of can't comprehend those other people as being human beings same reason why if there's a bus crash in iran that kills 200 people that doesn't hit you as hard as if your neighbor's dog passes away because the distance like logically it it should but it's like well they're too far away i've never met them and so they're not real to me So the premise of my article was kind of taking this idea and and stretching it to like a lot of the sources of anxiety in your life is you trying to process a world that requires you to rely on way more than 150 people at every at every level And, and that you can't really process the fact that everything you touch was made by some other human being somewhere who is just as much a human being as you. So that's something the first time I, I read that it like blew my mind and I was all but like, well, this should be, there should be like a religion around this. This, this makes, this makes so much sense. But the only place it really comes up is in like business seminars where they're talking like, well, your company, your department should only have 150 people or else, you know, it's the process breaks down. 
outside of that, it's kind of an obscure little little fact. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I, I have a I do have a TikTok now that is a lot of it's it's the same just kind of weird oddball things that I've that I've noticed about the world or or trivia stuff that I remember from crack that like little facts that got debunked. Um none no more of them are coming to mind at the moment but that my brain is full of those things that that's my whole that's uh and a lot of that stuff makes it into the books as part of part of why the books are scary and part of why they're ridiculous is there's a lot of along the way a lot of trivia about the way brains work and the way societies work things like that yeah that's kind of a i guess the uh what you have instead of lovecraft's racism I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, uh, and also uh, it's worth pointing out that you you write a sci-fi series starting with uh, futuristic violence in fancy suits and sequel to that, Zoe punches the future in the dick, which might be my favorite Jason Pudge in title. Um, there are many to choose from. And uh, yeah, that's kind of a, again, comedy sci-fi adventure, but very much a social sci-fi. So if you do want to, observe some weird facts eloquently put uh yeah follow jason on tiktok i assume i don't use tiktok or any of the other platforms that for people over 30 i don't know um boy i did not i I, this has come up on every show i do because it's it's like well you're on tiktok and every every host has the same thing like i'm scared of being on there i i did it I did it by necessity. I mean, I'm I'm 47 years old. That's 96 in TikTok years. Um, Dude, you're making me feel <laughs> way old here. <laughs> yeah, and so I thought TikTok was still like teenage teenagers doing like viral just dances or whatever because that's the only thing I had been exposed to. It turns I out everybody's dance, Jason. I just can't. <laughs> Sorry. It turns out, uh, no, everybody has moved to TikTok. That you you don't realize how dead every other social platform is until you attempt to go on TikTok. So I started an account in August, and it erupted immediately. Not because there's anything compelling about my face and my voice, I think, or my dance moves, but that's just where all the people are. So like, I have I have a Facebook account under my name that I've had like a fan page. Not my personal Facebook, but like a Facebook fan page for my writing I've had since 2007. I had it for 15 years, and I have 18,000 followers there. I've had a TikTok for two months, and I've got 22,000 followers on it. Like, that's how fast it took for it to overcome. And that's half, like, I've had a Twitter since literally Twitter was invented. When the first days it was out, I started an account. So I've had it for whatever, 14 years, however long that's been around. I have 50,000 followers there. I, th- at the rate that TikTok is growing, that'll eclipse that by the end of the year. Yeah, and the is, thing with TikTok is it's showing, it's showing your videos. To, it's testing constantly testing out videos to different people because I didn't know you were on TikTok, oddly enough, until maybe about an hour before this podcast. I don't know, maybe my phone listened to me or something. But I was just on there, I was just on there and uh, one, your promo for if this book exists, you're in the wrong universe, just popped on my, on my, onto my FYP. And I was like, well, this is an interesting coincidence. <laughs> uh, you, yeah, co- coincidence. Yeah, let's let's call it that. Uh, rather yeah. than a yeah a, a machine learning algorithm that is spooky in how yeah. it because the whole thing is you, you do have to train TikTok like if you don't want to see the anti-vax conspiracy stuff, you don't want to see like the the women advise, you know, advertising their OnlyFans accounts. You want to get that out of your feed. Um, you do have to tell it. That once you've trained it, like what you watch, what you like, what you, because you hold, you do a long press on a video and it brings up the not interested button. That's what a lot of people, it's a key, a key move to learn. Um, If you give it a few weeks to train it, it is eerie. And so to the point that I will have like, you know, like my wife and I don't, you know, don't, I don't think follow each other on there because I don't want people bothering her. Like, hey, when's your husband going to finish the next book? That she will get my videos because the machine learning does the hops of, well, she likes this and that's similar to this. And it will give us, like, she'll show me some funny animal video that's like, oh, look at this. This this dog fell all the way down the stairs. And it's like the one I'm watching at the moment, <laughs> even though their system doesn't know we are married and we don't follow each other. But it has both advertised, it has, it has analyzed our habits and our sensibilities and everything else to 
to a fine enough point that it will feed us the exact same thing um, at the exact same time. It's it's weird. It, it is so sophisticated beyond anything you ever saw with Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Um, they all seem antiquated once you've been on TikTok for a while. I see why everybody went there. I also see why it's a, a terrifying technology and why people are afraid of it and they're afraid of yeah. uh, the who the who owns it and all of that stuff. But um, yeah. I think I preferred the coincidence explanation and maybe I'm just going to stick with that. <laughs> but um, interesting <laughs> yeah, you should yeah. say that because that is core of the, uh, the sci-fi element of your kind of near future sci-fi uh, futuristic violence and fancy suits is the effect of social media on... Uh, on all on all kinds of things, including warfare or urban warfare. <laughs> yeah, and it is. And he says near future. The whole idea is that it's far enough in the future, like the cars are are still on the ground. They don't fly really, um, and it's not it's not a future where you know it doesn't take place on Mars. So it it's, it implies it takes place like maybe thirty years from now. Um, but it is a world where, for example, the social media they have is basically everyone is live streaming all the time. So there's like you can pin a little tiny camera and like a button and it just live streams your life. And then their Internet is just you can browse all of these feeds. It's every every car has a camera. Every person has a camera. Every every public place has a camera. So their Internet is like this God's eye view of anything. So, for example, if there's a mass shooting downtown in in what whatever denver colorado on this network it will take you there and you can watch it from any angle any any viewer who's in the area any security cameras in the area any car dash cameras in the area and you can just hop from feed to feed and it has like an algorithm that takes you to the most interesting so you can follow like a police chase from camera 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 because there's just eyeballs everywhere well the implication of that is that i've i've tried to extrapolate is what does this do to your behavior when you know you're always on camera? Because we're almost there in the sense that you can, in theory, almost be on camera. But for example, we will all still have like a private conversation in a restaurant and be pretty confident that it's not being filmed. That this is a world where it almost certainly is, where everything you say outside your home is certainly is being recorded. So it is a world where everyone has a version of themselves, a character they have to play the moment they leave their home in the same sense that I guarantee you the person these people are on Instagram today, it's not who they are in real life. Like their breakfast that they took a picture of, like not every meal is photogenic. Sometimes they do just, you know, eat some uh, Doritos in their underwear, but they don't, that, that doesn't go on Instagram. Well, here's a world where you're always. My, my wife would put that on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, so the, look at it, man. The premise is what happens to a world where your your everyone has to like play a character, and basically you have to conform your life and your personality around the fact that you're always performing for an audience at all times, and um, the 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 stars like the protagonists are a group of people where their superpower is basically manipulating that reality because they're like the people who have realized that the real power in the future is not being strong, it's not being armed, it's not being lethal. It's in knowing how to manipulate perception in this world where every everything is a camera all the time. And that's what these books are about. And again, they're also very ridiculous. To be clear, the title of the second book is Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick. There's a satire element to it. Um, but that's, but yeah, that, that's the premise because <laughs> I'm someone who, you know, by the time social media came around, I was an adult. I, I didn't have to be raised as a teenager in the Instagram era or the YouTube era. And I don't know what would have become of me if I, if I had, like I barely survived high school as it was the idea of being bullied by like a thousand, 10,000 people on social media on top of that. I can't, I can't, I can't process it. You know, because when when did Facebook come around? What well, was like two thousand five or something like that? I don't know. You know, so it's a thing where right, I would have been around thirty. Like I was a fully formed person. So this is a real like source of fascination to me, watching how the world has changed. Because when I showed up on the internet, 
the reason I thought I was so drawn to it was because cameras hadn't been invented yet that were ca like internet cameras hadn't been like obviously actual cameras been invented. So it's like it's just the words. It's just the stuff I type, right? Nobody cares that I look weird. Nobody cares that I struggle to pronounce lots of words. Nobody cares that I spit when I talk. It's just the words and that I can do. Like I can tell funny jokes in text. I can like I I've always I've always taken to being able to write things. It's like this is a, a world where your ideas live on their own, completely separate from you. It's not a popularity contest. It's not about who's the most handsome or the strongest. This is like a nerd's paradise because only this is about who's the smartest, the most compelling, you know, whose per, whose thought processes are most compelling to other people, and it will always be like that forever. I thought, uh, and then whereas now, like you see TikTok take over and it's a little heartbreaking to me that the same nerd now would be like, you have to think, how can I make myself presentable? Um, I don't know, like, because you, the cameras are so good and, and, and your skin is bad and like, it's, you've got a freaking, you know, your phone is broadcasting in 4k and every flaw shows, I can't imagine. I, I can't, I can't imagine. I, and it feels like something was lost that was very special to me, which was the, the old ideas on the internet. And now it feels like it's high school again. It's who's the okay. hottest or who's the most popular or whatever. Or who knows how to edit video the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a skill that apparently every child has from age five on now. Like, you should see me trying to edit even a simple piece of video. And I, I struggle so much, but it's like, you know, meanwhile, every, by the time you're seven or eight years old, you can master dubbing in audio and syncing it up with effects and stuff. Yeah. So I went to university to learn that. That was a hey, yeah. waste of time. <laughs> 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 and my daughter shakes her head in shame at, at what I put out. <laughs> <laughs> that might not be the quality of your editing. <laughs> no, it is. No, yeah, that, that's the reason. You might be <laughs> I, yeah, that's a, I don't let her see the content. <laughs> Sitting there in your underwear eating burritos, wondering why she's shaking her head at you. These are cool rants. That means I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one last question because it is the spooky season, and you are predominantly a horror writer, a hey, a horror dick joke writer. Um, are you a horror fan? Are you a horror movie fan? Do you have a favorite horror movie? Um, I don't have a specific favorite horror movie. The stuff I've loved the most recently are like streaming has been a blessing for me because stuff like foreign movies like the Korean horror movies, like the whaling, that stuff I would have never been exposed to before because my small town video store did not have a Korean movie section. Um, I love that stuff. I, the last one I watched was uh, I Saw the Devil, also out of South Korea, um, and just a brutal, brutal film. Uh, and it, and brutal in a way that I don't think they make American movies like that anymore. Oh yeah. Yeah. Asian the, cinema the South, is its own thing. Yeah. The South Korean, the South Korean film scene is, is truly bonkers. Yes. Um, they're putting out some amazing content. And, and again, I can't make, I don't want to make myself sound like I've, you know, I have obscure taste. I, I seek out Asian cinema. It's like, no, this pops up on, it, it was just on my Netflix. It was on my, it was on my Amazon prime recommendations. Like it is wonderful that you can be exposed to stuff like that um, now because it's, I don't know if it's because, and again, it's not because I'm too smart or sophisticated for, you know, Hollywood horror doesn't scare me anymore. I'm too cool for that. It's not that. It's just, I think there are tropes that you're so used to that you can feel the jump scares coming. It's just, um, whereas these films are from a different culture that where the whole sensibility is a little bit different and the rhythms of the storytelling are a little bit different. It just has an ability to take me by surprise in a way that like these are twists I don't see coming, but they're from a different tradition. It's from a different storytelling. Yeah, mo most of um, my search history is Asian as well. Okay. 
Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> we were having a nice conversation. <sighs> yeah, we're, um, we're be, being the operative word. But to, uh, the most, uh, the scariest thing I've seen in the last probably 10 years is that probably that Chernobyl miniseries on HBO, which oh, yeah. was um, by the. It's terrible that I don't know the name of the creator of that thing because he's he, it, he did an incredible job with it. But it was basically it was a miniseries. It was about Chernobyl. It was about a real event, but it was very much shot like a horror series. And everything about the way it unfolds and the atmosphere, like the very the Soviet nature of the buildings, everything uh, the, it's so oppressive and gray, and everything about circumstances it has all the horror tropes, including the powerful person who won't listen. And won't believe them when they try to tell them what's happening. You know that it's all the stuff that, ha and knowing that it really happened for the most part, just like that. It, it, it was one of the most incredible pieces of horror filmmaking I've seen. Um, and like the, the consequences of like what the the monster, you know, the meltdown of what it can do to you and what it does to the human body and how long it takes. Uh, that's it, you know everything about it. it, it the this, the way it built up dread and suspense and. There's moments of humor, humor and levity and all that. The performances, um, it's it's. I, I know people love like a lot of the Netflix miniseries, is like Midnight Mass and all that. I nothing to me matches what he pulled off in that Chernobyl series. Yeah, have you guys all That's seen it, or have some of you seen it? I would check uh, it out. I've seen bits. I've seen I bits of not. it. And it's it's. Yeah, I, it's astounding. Uh, yeah, I, I have not gotten around. Yeah, to I, that. I mostly avoid things that are based on reality. I get enough of reality during the day. <laughs> I do prefer my horror to be fictional and harmless. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I don't like, um, you know, like they have that the Jeffrey Dahmer series on Netflix. Like I've not watched that. I, I don't. I don't have much of yeah. an interest in where they've fictionalized like a serial killer or that kind of thing. It, hmm. It's not that it seems tasteless. It, it it's fine to tell the stories. I just don't. I don't know. I watched it because in my wife's Korean, she'd never heard of him. So I thought, yeah. Yeah, you should be. Well, I introduce it to American culture. Well, no, I mean, I she's she's been here for years, but this is something. It's in the it's in the in the consciousness. You, my kids know about it. She should know about it. Here, honey, we're gonna sit down and watch watch a show about a person with peculiar taste. <laughs> um. Uh, yeah. Well, and and specifically the the one. The one thing that I couldn't watch in that, and the one thing that actually happened, and I know that made it into the the series, is where one of his young teenage victims escaped mm. and ran into the police because the neighbors were like, "There's this naked man bleeding from the head wandering the streets," and the police it, it found him. And Jeffrey Dahmer came out of his apartment and said, "Oh yeah, that's my that's my uh, that's my boyfriend." I'm like, all right, here he is. They handed him back to the serial killer to take back into his home. Ugh. To uh, gruesomely kill later, they did not. But they they like came back, went back up to Dahmer's apartment, and, like noted in their report that it smelled bad because of. And we now know it was rotting human flesh that from body parts he had in his bathtub. Um, and in the report, they made some crude like gay joke, like "Oh, who knows? You know what these these people get Ugh. up to? These two men. Like, let's get out of here. Mm. It's quickening me out." Um, and did not pay attention to what was clearly. The guy was bleeding and is wandering around in a daze because Jeffrey Dahmer drilled a hole in his skull anyway. So uh, knowing that actually yeah. happened, I would struggle to get the entertainment value out of because mm -hmm. that guy and that guy's family yeah. is still out there somewhere and they're watching this yeah. show. It's oh, like yeah, that, that's why I like fictional horror. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. like, you know, as I as I tell people, yeah. it's like in my books, I've killed hundreds of people, but you know something, I sleep fine at night because I haven't hurt a single person. <laughs> Yeah, and doing should also be yeah. mentioned that Rick calls the shack behind his house his books. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, uh, but no, and I do, and I'm doing Cosmic Core, which is uh, monsters and tentacles and stuff from other dimensions. There's a reason for that, rather than you know a a man who yeah. kills his wife and, and tortures children. It's like no, I, I've. Uh, I've had family members who are police officers. I grew up hearing about that stuff happening for real around town. I. Don't have the stomach. Don't have the stomach for it. I like my horror to be a little bit silly in what's in in what's happening. If you're going to do a killer, then give me you know something like Hannibal Lecter or or whatever, where it's he's so so over the top that it's like this guy cannot actually exist. That's what's 
fun about that character. It's like you cannot actually have a Hannibal Lecter. It's, um, it, I need it to be, there needs to be a thick veneer of unreality. Um, I put off watching the Chernobyl thing because I thought, well, it's, it's about a nuclear disaster. Like, Why do I want to care about it? It's like, you got to watch it. Like, you've got to watch it. It blew me away. It was the creepiest I, uh, freaking thing I've ever seen in my life. I, I used to work. Uh, I used to work in a um, small town hospital, so I, I, I feel you. The vibe of the the shit gets too real. Yeah, people people think that yeah. nothing happens in small towns. If you know cops yeah. from small towns, people think, oh, why do you get you know rescue cats from trees? It's like no, no, no. There's a there's a big meth problem. Twenty percent of them of these people are unemployed, and they are alcoholics. And the stuff they they do to their wives and to their kids. It's the same stuff you see in the city. It's uh, just you don't yeah. you don't see it on the news because it happened in a little small town. Yeah, that that's that's why I prefer monster horror because as, as as you said, there's that fun element because you know it's so it's there's a, that ridiculous enough element where you don't have to worry about about it. You know you can turn off the TV and even though you might go into your basement to lock up at, at three in the morning and the shadows are like freaking you out, you know that. You just watched a movie about, say, a giant killer ape, and that's not really there. <laughs> yeah, I like yeah. how you immediately went to giant killer ape. Dude, it's my <laughs> thing. <laughs> I mean, apes are real and could kill somebody, so Dude. that that's actually not that. I'm sure an ape has murdered someone. You, you, know, you, know, some you know something? You know something? I guarantee there probably will be a point where I walk down to my basement and there's an escape gorilla down there, and I look and I'm like, well, this is ironic. Right before it bashes my head, not even a gorilla man. Any kind of monkey in your basement. That's a horror story. Man, <laughs> man, man torn to, to shreds by like, you know, by, by howler monkey in basement. <laughs> by capuchin. That's I mean, not. Yeah. Yeah. They go yeah. directly for the genitals, Rick. Directly for the genitals. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Irony. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be absolutely clear, if you, if, if any, in, in the highly likely situation that you should be in a confrontation with some sort of a primate, they will mess you up. Uh, I am. They oh, are yeah. much stronger than they look. Uh, yeah. If you, I'm not saying this. Having, I've never fought a monkey, uh, but anyone who has fallen into a, an enclosure at a zoo or has worked in an area with uh, whatever chimpanzees, take your pick. They are yeah. unbelievably strong, and if they decide to start chewing on you, they will eat your face right yeah. off, as happened yeah, in that one yeah, famous yeah, incident. Apparently, chimpanzees have a thing for fucking people up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I, have a, I actually have a really funny story about that. My uh, A friend of mine who was former military um, had to do a security brief with a bunch of soldiers because a squad of Marines found a baboon on the side of the road and they tried to put a U.S. Marine Corps TV uh, t-shirt on the baboon and the baboon oh beat God. the shit out of the entire squad. <laughs> That's understandable. <laughs> that baboon is not a Marine. <laughs> so the, uh, the brief the next clearly day... clearly a Navy man. Was, was basically like, <laughs> the brief was basically like, yeah, um, don't try to stick t-shirts on baboons. They don't like that. <laughs> A baboon was not about to do stolen valor. God no, damn it. No. <laughs> baboon had dignity. Jason, we've said it on this podcast before, but it's worth saying again. If you're out there, please don't fight a monkey of any kind. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it, it's not people trying to fight them that's the problem. It's, it's because of pop culture, you assume they are very like whimsical creatures. And it's like, oh, they're kind of like people. And their expressions are kind of like people. So people think, well, I could walk up and feed one. Like if, if I'm on, you know, safari somewhere, I'm in another country where, where they actually are running around. It's like, oh, well, give, give it a little bit of your banana. That'll be funny. I'll take your picture. No. Except plenty of people will kill you too. Yeah, but like if, if, yeah. Like, if it's one of those ones that are small enough to stand on your shoulder and you want to fight it, you could probably take them, right? <laughs> God, I want, to, I want to see one of those little, like, one of those little, like, you know, clapping the symbols together monkeys just fuck Bob up now. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I gotta say, for legal reasons, even if it's a very small monkey, I'm not saying you should do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, He's just saying he believes yeah. in you. In a situation where you had no other choice, like if you were cornered and you had to fight your way out, could you? But yeah, if, now obviously you would not have instigated that encounter. But <laughs> the accordion grinder, just like yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of uh, uh, silly, unreal. And a very compelling and hilarious horror. 
If this book exists, you're in the wrong universe. Did I get that right? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, part of the John Dies at the End series. And also uh, other books. Yeah, check out Futuristic Violence and Fancy Suits. Check out Jason Pargin on social media. You'll be glad you did. All kinds of uh, weirdness. Probably not fighting a monkey <laughs> on TikTok just yet. Probably not that desperate for views, I'm, but who knows? Stay tuned. what I have to do. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm about a week away. <laughs> if you, if you want to find me on TikTok, it's the username is Jason K. Pargin. P-A-R-G-I-N. Just drop the follow. Excellent. Anything else you want to shout out before we wrap up? No, if, if you don't use TikTok, any of the other platforms, just search for, for my name. And the book, it is part of a series. If you've not read any of the other ones and you start, want to start with this one, I don't know why you would, as it's the most expensive one. But if for some reason you want, you do, you can jump in with this one. It's not, uh, it's not a serial. It's, these are episodic. You can start with, read them in any order. They're equally confusing, regardless of which order you read them in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you can just start with a movie if you, if you like. John Dies at the End, starring Paul Giamatti, directed by Don Coscarelli. Uh, a strong recommend if you like yeah. weird cosmic horror and dick jokes. It's on Amazon Prime at the moment, I think. It may also be on Hulu. It's it's out there. Just Google Google it. You'll you'll find it. You know how to find movies. Yeah, they probably do. Okay, uh, well, that was uh, brilliant. We got to talk about monkey fighting, which uh, we tried to do every episode. <laughs> Uh, thanks for joining us, Jason Pargin. Uh, best of luck with your next release, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks, thanks for man. coming. Nice to yeah, meet you. Thank you. Thanks.